<clears throat> Couldn't find the original presentation. This is kind of a pre-writing of it, but you get the gist out of the material. Let me just take another quick look. kind of an ad hoc this presentation was done at uh, DEFCON 13 and I did it here about was about three or four weeks ago at Interzone uh, we have a couple pieces of code associated to this the, the initial piece of it's really simple code and you'll see in the presentation was released at DEFCON uh, for the users to go ahead and do with and there was another piece of code basically called impersonate uh, which you'll see demonstrated here uh, that was released at Interzone we didn't release it at DEFCON there was a little bit of uneasiness about doing that because of what your possibilities of that piece of code but we finally gave up on that and went ahead and released it I had such a uh, backlash on people wanting it uh, then they realized how simple and small it was they were like oh geez okay today's presentation the insecure workstation uh, the information provided in this presentation is for educational purposes only uh, I am no way responsible for any damage that is a result or of the use or misuse uh, provided in this presentation. Uh, there were originally two parts of this presentation. We're only going to do one. We're doing subverting Windows logon. Uh, the key takeaways is better understanding of desktop console vulnerabilities, uh, protecting information assets with layered defense principles. And every, you get some people laughing there. Uh, you typically see. Uh, you know, people say defense, uh, defense in depth principles. Well, what I'm trying to do is get everyone to throw that term out and start using layered defense, and that's because I own the site layeredefense.com, and I figure push come to shove, I could at least sell the site for a couple grand down the road. <laughs> uh, and subverting desktop security for fun and entertainment. Uh, let's skip over to help APIs. Uh, and this was a project we were working on basically hey you get a Windows login prompt that comes up is there any ways for an attacker to subvert that uh, whether he does it up front or whether he backdoors it can it be done so that's some of the stuff we were looking into doing um, credit for all the hard work uh, I didn't do all this myself I had a couple friends who helped me out building this uh, project and doing a little bit of the research involved in it three rules that drove this research I like things that are extremely simple uh, I don't like complex attacks and hacks. Uh, it needs to fit into my pocket, if not my head. It's something you have to be able to carry in simply in your head or on a USB stick or on a small CD. That's the type of attack I like. Uh, and you must be able to protect against it. I want the people that I'm showing this stuff to can go back to their organization and go, hey, look at this. Wow. What are we doing to protect against this type of stuff? And have some simple things that they can do to actually reduce the risk within their environment. Um, why, what, why, where, when, how. Basically, can Windows log on be subverted? Yes, and it's really simple. Uh, now, why do we do this? Was it curiosity just because it's there? No, we're actually trying to create a learning experience that people can take back and actually better secure their environments when they have a true understanding of, uh, of the risk and threats that are involved in some desktop security. Um, things that can be done. It, it works against XP, uh, Windows 2003. Um, Bob is back on the job. Uh, what that basically means is in a presentation I did at DEF CON 12, I introduced this hacker character, Bob, who basically would subvert security within his organization. Well, Bob's going to get kind of promoted in the story here, so you'll get to see that. Uh, how this attack takes place, well, there's two main pieces of it. There's a methodology, the attack process. So basically, we've taken some simple programmatic programs in themselves mean nothing, built a methodology around this to deploy these, to handle these, and put them in the right place that we could subvert Windows log on and do some other nasty things. So we're going to start out. Exploit part one, utility manager. I don't know if everyone's familiar with utility manager. Uh, what is a utility manager? Utility manager is an application that Microsoft put on here that gives you access to uh, uh, things like the on-screen keyboard, give you the uh, magnifier, um, 
and the uh, the audio part that reads the text stuff that you click on. It's usually tools that have been put on here for people that have certain handicaps. Okay, let's take a look. I want to take a look at what Microsoft says about their utility manager. Basically, utility manager enables users to check an accessibility program status, start and stop accessibility programs. So basically, it's an application that you use to start and stop other applications. Simple as that. So where it starts breaking down at, Microsoft's nice enough to tell us that, users can also start accessibility programs before logging onto the computer by pressing the Windows logo key and the U at the, on the welcome screen. So basically, Windows has given us an application that we can use to start and stop other applications prior to ever logging onto the box. So why is this such a problem? Well, when you log onto the box and you start Windows Utility Manager up, it starts running under your credentials. But if you're not logged onto the box and you do it, it runs under system. So Microsoft's given us an application that we can start and stop other applications on the box at system level without ever logging on. So I think you're starting to see how the security's breaking down here real quick. Explore, uh, the exploit part two, the log on screen. To get an understanding of this architecture and how, how we could get this to work, let's step back here real quick. Why is this such a problem? I mentioned that you can do the system level stuff. So basically, we were starting to think about this at this point, and we thought, okay, well, OSK.exe is the on screen keyboard. What if we replaced it with just command exe? Just go ahead, rename, C, rename cmd.exe, osk.exe, and drop it in, or what would happen? So we did that. Windows U, and clicked on the osk.exe, the on-screen keyboard, and it looked like nothing happened. But we looked into the system, and we found out command exe did execute and was running on the system at system level. We did not get any... Uh, security areas or anything kicked back from Microsoft. The problem was it was running in a non-interactive mode. It was actually running like a service in the background. So that brings us to the next part. Why was it doing that and how do we fix that problem? User interface objects are managed using Windows stations and desktops. Basically Windows stations come in two flavors, interactive and non-interactive Windows station. And in a program, to define an interactive station, that, something that the user can interface with on a desktop, you have to define it with an application to run under WinStay0. That is the only interactive functionality. Second, Windows has multiple desktop environments. When you're in, on your box, you've logged in and you're working, you're working in what's known as the default desktop. That means if an application kicks off a process, it can be defined as Wednesday Zero Default Desktop. That means run this interactively on the user's default desktop. Screen Saver is another desktop. We haven't really done anything with that, but the Win Logon is a separate desktop. So basically what we need to do now is we need to define the process that we want to run on the Win Logon desktop. We define it to run under Wednesday Zero Desktop Win Logon. And if we do that, our process should run within that environment without us ever logging on. So that came to the third part. Okay, now we need to build the code for that. The code in itself poses no security issues. Uh, basically, we're just setting a create process thread to run under the win log on desktop using Wednesday zero, the interactive desktop. The security breakdown is how we're using it, the methodology. We are taking advantage of architectural design issue within Microsoft. And that design issue is the fact that Microsoft gave the users the ability to start and stop applications at system level without ever logging on. And the code is extremely simple. There's the code. And as you can see in the, in the code, basically we're defining the desktop as Wednesday zero win logon and then we're running the process command DXE. So basically if we take this program, compile it up, replace the osk.exe on the system, we can come to a box, go win you, bring it up, go osk, and get a command prompt on the box without ever logging on. So 
So, come to the final part of this. How do we get the code on the box, the delivery method? Now, we looked at several different methods. Uh, if you have admin access, you can replace the OSK. There's ways of doing it. Hey, you're already admin access. Who really cares at this point? Uh, API vulnerabilities, you can use existing. That was in the first part of the presentation that I'd done out there. You can use API call vulnerabilities where you can escalate your rights to system level. And at that point, you can go ahead and change the files. But you're already at system level, so there's nothing to gain there. One of the hardest things we worked on and got it to work was bit level modification of the hard disk. We actually booted up on a DOS. I can't remember what DOS version it was identified the tracks and sectors that OSK was written on, and then overwrote the first 512 bytes with our code and, and got, it, got that to work. But it's extremely complex. The easiest thing to do is a maintenance boot disk. Windows PE or a BART PE disk, simple enough. So what we did was I took a BART PE disk, set it up, modified everything on it. So you walk in there, you sl slap that into the CD-ROM, boot off of it, when it boots up and done booting, you pull the disk off, shut the power off, walk away. At that point, it should replace the OSK. No interaction from the user other than just m mounting up the CD or booting from the CD. And that seemed to be the best way to do it. Very simple, easily available to everyone on the internet. Okay, so now let's, ta let's take a look at this whole vulnerability. So instead of me logging out, uh, we'll go ahead and the story, the story I put together for this whole thing is kind of interesting. What if you had a company in the research development department and they were coming up with all these new secrets and they had a competitor down the road. That competitor decided, hey, you know what? We can make a really good money if we can steal the stuff that he's working on because he's getting ready to go to market. So how do we do that? Well, you know, let's go ahead and get one of our people to work for his janitorial services. Okay, so what they do is they talk Bob, one of their employees, into going down there and applying for a job as a janitor. Of course, Bob gets hired. Okay, so the first night on the job, Bob shows up with all of his tools, his USB, his CDs. He goes around the different offices. He walks up to the office. Let's say he walks up to John's office. He slaps, John happens to be the manager of the research and development team. He slaps the CD in there, boots off the box, shuts it off walks out, goes and does his job, finished, does his cleaning. John comes in the next day, logs on to this machine, does his work throughout the day, and when John's done, what's John do? He either walks away from his box and the screensaver locks the box, or he locks it himself. So here we are. John has walked out, he's gone out of the office for the day, in comes Bob. Bob walks up to this machine. He knows what he's done. Windows U key. He brings up the utility manager. On screen keyboard is running. Starts it up. Boom. He has a command prompt without ever logging into the machine. Now, from here, there's a lot of things Bob can do. <laughs> He can copy files. He can use uh, uh, some methods we use for stealing stuff off the system. He can use some uh, um, password tools for dumping the hashes, taking them offline and cracking them. Uh, some of the other things he can do that we've actually tested is using uh, like Tiny Hexer, a memory program. S since we're running at system level here, scan down through all the running processes and scan for the words password, passwd, pwd, and we've been successful in quite a few cases of stripping passwords right out of running processes on a box. It's quite common. Um, I know we can pull them out for if you're running Novell. We know the offsets that you can strip the passwords out for a Novell connection. Uh, most of IBM's workplace type stuff uh, is Java driven is riddled with the password. It's not in there once. It's like in there a dozen times. So there's a lot of ways to strip stuff off that way. One thing we did find out in this, in this environment, you can get up a full desktop, but it's resource intensive, and it'll start flaking out, and the graphics will start breaking down after a period of time. Uh, so we, you're better off running individual apps that you may want to run from here. Unfortunately, I don't have a separate drive to do network connections and stuff, because there's some other stuff.